Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Um, can we uh, share the Bible with chapter 46? So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him. His sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah were Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Puvu, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulon were Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram with his daughter Dina. All the persons, his sons and his daughters, were 33. The sons of Gad were Ziphion, Hagi, Shuni, Ezbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Ishua, Isui, Beria, and Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Beria were Heber and Malkiel. These were the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom As Asenath, the daughter of Potpharah, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The son of Dan was Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jazil, Guni, Jezer, and Shilem. These were the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body besides Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were seven. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock and they have brought their flocks, their herds and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say, 
Your servants' occupation has been with livestock from our youth, even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, where every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servant dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell? Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as, far, as Pharaoh commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number in their families. Now there was no bread in, the, in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt, and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Then Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock. If the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land, by us and our land for bread? And we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, but the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because the famine was severe upon them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh and they ate their rations, which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for your food for those of your households, and as food for your little one. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day, that Pharaoh should have one-fifth, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. 
So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now, if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. So uh, it seems like Jacob had um, had hesitation about going to Egypt first. So he goes to Beersheba on his way. Beersheba, if I can share this with you, um, let me just share this so we can get the idea where Beersheba is. So this is the station that uh, Jacob stop at before they go to uh, Egypt. So let me share this with you. Here. Do you see this? Yeah. So Dan is the top city. If you look at it, the bottom city is Beersheba. Uh, that little um, gray, blackish spot, of course, the blue spot, blue stuff on the left side is the Mediterranean. And the Dead Sea is the grayish black stuff uh, on the right side. Beersheba is the bottommost city. To go to Egypt, you have to go down. Egypt is actually, you have to continue going down, going south. So uh, if J Jacob was around the Hebron or Bethel or somewhere else, he had to go through Beersheba to go to Egypt. Beersheba is a place where uh, Abraham had established, where he called on the name of the Lord earlier. And there it seems like God is going to speak to Jacob. Jacob was a little bit hesitant to go to Egypt, not very comfortable at old age. You're going to the um, the capital or the heart of the Egyptian empire where everything happens. It's almost like you're moving to the big country, to the big place, the civilization. Jacob is not very comfortable because he's a, a Bedouin person. He's a shepherd. So God has to tell him something. So um, in, in the and the uh, account, we see that he goes and God shows him, shows him in a vision that he will be fine. Let's go there. Um, that's 46. And God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father, Isaac, of course, not fear to go down to Egypt. Most probably he was afraid. And for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes, bring you up again. What does God mean by that? What does God mean by bring you up again, uh, knowing that Jacob is going to die in Egypt? There is something here, and I, I want us to stop at it, just to, to kind of forget ourselves and go in time back and put ourselves in the shoes of Jacob and Joseph. Um, what does God mean when he say, I will bring you up again? We will know that Jacob will die in Egypt. That will be the ending. Both Jacob and Joseph will die in Egypt. But then we see in chapter 47 that Jacob had um, a request. 
so um, so we go to verse 29 when the time drew near that Israel must die he could he called his son Joseph especially and said to him now if I have found favor in your sight please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. This is the second time we see this kind of swearing for a son or a servant to put his hand under the thigh of the man. It has a meaning of swearing and oath. It's like raising our hands or putting it on the Bible. Uh, many explanations had said why this would be this, the solemn swearing or an oath. And uh, some of it said it has to point out to the covenant with God since their circumcision is a covenant. So this is as close as you can to that place where um, the, the covenant of circumcision was made. So one of the explanations. On any case, that's how they used to swear. Um, so he said to him something very important. He said, uh, I ask you for something to be kind to me. So what is it? The kindness that Joseph would show to his father. Of course, Joseph would do anything for Jacob. But he said, do not bury me in Egypt. When I die, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. You know, you think about the Egyptian burial thing. It's a, it's a big thing. The mummification and, you know, wrapping in strips of linen and putting them in a sarcophagus and, and, uh, and burying them in a very decorated tomb. It's something very elaborate, very extra uh, important. But he wants to go be buried in the cave of Machpelah with Abraham and Isaac. Let me lie with my fathers. You should carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And then Joseph said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. He was comforted. What is the point? Anyone have an idea why Jacob insists that he should not be buried in Egypt? Well, you know, if you die, if somebody dies, they die. What, why do they care where they get buried? Today we have this uh, crazy idea of cremation and people cremate. That's what they do. You know? But why would Jacob ask that his bones would be buried with Isaac and, and Abraham? So that's a very important question. And I wanted to kind of dedicate some time to think about this. Um, we go back to uh, the the cave of Machpelah. That's what I want to get the account of. Cave of Machpelah. Cave of the Patriarchs. So this is what they call it. The cave of the Patriarchs or tomb of the Patriarchs known to Jews as the cave of Machpelah and translated cave of the double tombs or cave of the double caves um, and they call it the sanctuary of abraham in uh, in, uh, in islam it's a series of cave in the heart of the old city of hebron in the southern western bank um, this is uh, this is jewish and muslims actually have it this is what it is it looks like this now, um, so what is the point? What is the point of this key? And I want to find it in the in the. Um, Just let's think about this question. Why Jacob insists that he should not be buried in Egypt? Um, I'm kind of forgetting, but didn't God... I, I mean, it's like, it was Abraham's... Is it Abraham's resting place? And like God asked, told yeah. him he would rest there. Yeah. And he bought it specifically to rest there. 
to and his wife Sarah before yes him. when Sarah died this is when you hear about it the first time and it is um, let me just to the place where it is in the Bible it's uh, and then is Isaac also is, yeah yeah so it is mentioned in the 49 where but it starts in 23 when we went in 23 9. So this is where I want to go to read about it first. And you, you want I want a list of the people that were buried there. So chapter 23 speaks of Sarah's death. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirgath, Kirjas Arba. That's Hebrew. Actually. She died in Hebrew. In the land of Canaan. That's the same place where you have the, the, the cave. And Abraham came to the to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up, up from before his dead, from Sarah, after he knelt next to her deathbed, and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I'm a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the son of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Here, us, my Lord, you are a mighty person, prince. Among us, bury your dead in the choicest of your burial places, of our burial places. They have, they have uh, tombs. None of us will withhold from you his burial place, that you may bury your dead. This is a way, a very nice way of speaking in the Middle East. They, they would offer things, even if they're in, you know, in their heart, they don't really want to give anything, but they have to say that. Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, sons of Heth, and he spoke with them, saying, It is your wish that I bury my dead, if it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give you the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of this field. Let him give it to me at the full price uh, as property for a burial place among you. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron, the Hittite, answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered the gate of his, of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Again, a kind of a, a gist, gister of generosity. It might not be, you know, serious, or but it has to be acted this way. This is a ritual. And Abraham bowed himself down before the people again of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me. I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What's that between you and me? So bury your dead. So gently he's saying the price. But in a very nice, uh, like sandwich, he's trying to tell him, no, this is not important. You know, it's it's worth that money. But you know, what's that? It's not between you and me. But he already spelled the price. You see that the the language. It's a very gentle language, but that's that's how people do business and among each other and in, in that type and that part of the world because it's not about business. It's about relationships. So you don't want to lose the feeling of brotherhood while you're actually making business. And this is a totally different culture. Like it's not really the Western culture. Western culture, business is business. If it is going to be sold, you know, this is the, this is the price, give me the money, uh, we're, we have a deal. That's not how it is in the, in the Middle East. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded. And Abraham, to Abraham as a position in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of his city, and after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. 
who else was buried there? So I hope you could, you thought about the two questions. So definitely Sarah. This chapter is about her. And Abraham, of course. And Isaac. Isaac and and then Jacob. And Rebecca. <laughs> and Rebecca. <laughs> yes. The only person that will not be buried out of this family, out, out of all of them, the only person that will not be buried in this cave, because the whole family is going to be buried together, except Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel will be buried in Bethlehem, not in Hebron. Okay, this is something that the Bible will speak about again, that Ephrathah, uh, Bethlehem, Ephrathah would be the place of Rachel. So Jacob wants to go. So the second question now, why would Jacob want to go to be buried there? Why it is important for Jacob? What does it, does it really matter where they are going to be buried? They're dead, for goodness sake. They're bones. Why do they have to be like that? I mean, and, and uh, in Egypt, I know my great, you know, my great ancestors, my great grandmother, grandmother, my grandfather, and, and my father, they insisted on the same thing. They, they want to be buried together. Any idea? Why is that important? They're thinking of the resurrection. So they will resurrect together. Very good, Yehara. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yes. true. That's how they think. All these people think the same. They think we will be resurrected one day. Very interesting. Do you know that uh, resurrection had not happened yet? Nobody had mentioned resurrection, but I think those of us who were following up the study would know where they got that from. Joseph is going to do the same thing. We're going to come to it and talk about it. Where did he get the resurrection idea? From Abraham. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> when God asked Abraham to kill his son Isaac or to sacrifice his son Isaac, but God also promised him that from Isaac would come many descendants, Abraham figured out that if God was asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac, he would also resurrect his son Isaac from the dead because he he knew that God would not break his promises or God is, yeah, he knew that he, he had faith in God that um, and he trusted God that from Isaac, he, all his descendants would come. So, yeah. That's Hebrew, Hebrew 11, uh, 17. It, 17, 18, 19, right? Very true. And I would even say a little bit more. Why would God do this and doesn't really, there is no resurrection happening. So what's the whole point? There's not, no physical resurrection happened in the story of, of Isaac sacrifice. So what's the whole point of this trial? Well, it definitely shows generations to come like the image of Christ. Like, I guess. And then also just, I mean, it does strengthen Abraham's faith. It takes his faith to the next level to, to have faith in the resurrection. Yeah, I agree. I hope you all see this, that this was a lesson God's given to convey, not in a, which I don't think God likes this, you know, like to give direct information. It's not, he's more of a classical teacher. God is a more of a classical teacher. He doesn't like to give answers. God always gives questions, and the questions have only one answer, the only answer that will get people out, and the answer has to do with faith. So when God gives the riddle of Isaac's sacrifice, the only answer to that riddle is that God is able to raise from the dead. So once they grasp that, Abraham, starting from Abraham, prepare himself to, for resurrection. So what he would do, he would gather his whole family, in a place where they resurrect, they are going to go resurrect together. So is it important? According to this, I see an importance of keeping the bones somewhere. 
I, 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 I don't see. That's why the church actually does not really favor cremation that much. Because you get cremation and then you spread it all over the water, whatever. It kind of does not do the same thing. Yes, God, you're not going to make it difficult for God to resurrect us. But when you are resurrected, you want to be together. You want to be with your family, your church. You want to be with the people that you grew up and you are united with. So this is this is the point of this, that Jacob actually takes it very seriously. He is saying to Joseph, you're going to have to swear an oath. And you think about, you know, he's asking him to swear an oath to take care of the kids, to uh, uh, not, you know, do something harm to his brothers, to, uh, you know, be, uh, uh, to know God and to continue in the faith. And the big thing that he's asking for is not, none of it. He's asking to be buried with his family. And the fact that this is actually the Bible point more than one time, I think it is important and we have to pay attention to it. I don't think it's put there for, um, for no good reason. It's put there for a good reason that we think about resurrection for us too. Um, that is, that is um, the, I think, the main point that Jacob is going to ask about in the, in the chapters we, we read. Um, but then also there is another point that I want to, uh, highlight is you see here in Egypt the shepherds are abominable abominable what do you call it abomination abomination trying to get it back. abomination abominable abominable they are ready uh, they're uh, looked upon by the by the Egyptians as something dirty something uh, defiling. So that's why they keep them in a place by themselves. They give them, it's a very good land where you have like lots of water and grass for the sheep, but it's not a place where the Egyptians would like to live in with them. So uh, you would hear that later in the book of Exodus, something to keep in mind, that the Egyptians worship the calves and the bulls and the sheep and the rams, and they would not sacrifice them um, easily to any god, it will not be given. So they will use them for milk and for wool and stuff, but they would not sacrifice them. Something very close to the Indians today with the Hindus, talking about the Hindus. So uh, you just have to keep that in mind that the shepherds are not looked upon with favor. And, and they used to have foreigners for shepherds, not Egyptians. Egyptians would not be, you know, um, uh, excited to work as a shepherd is almost like exactly like herding pigs in Israel or in, in Muslim countries. That's not something they would like very much. Um, Jacob goes and God says, I will bring you up. What does that mean? God's going to bring him up, but he's going to die in Egypt. He's not going to come up. What does it mean? He says, I will prosper you. And you make you a great nation in Egypt. You will become very uh, a big number. And I will bring you up. In this language, what does it mean? Is that about Jacob personally or something else? Is he referring? Okay, this may be way out. But is he referring to the deliverance of Jacob's future generations out of Egypt and back up to the land? Correct. This is what it is because he's going to call the nation Israel. They are being, they're being called Israel. So Israel is the people as well as the person. So it is as if Israel is going to be that one person and later on is going to be the million and a half when after 400 years. That's why when you hear something like this, this is where I go, I'm going with it. When you say, God said, I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Okay. What does it mean? Now follow the same line of thinking. Then here he speaks not about the person. He speaks about the nations. Esau is Edom. The descendants of Esau are called the Edomites. And they had some very hateful uh, sins common among them. They, didn't, they took it easy and they were not really um, 
they were not very uh, they don't didn't think it was bad so they uh, they broke away from the covenant with god big time so this is what god says it's not about a person but even if the edomites have good people god would love them see that same thing with the, the ammonites and the moabites the moabites were very uh, sinful very very defiled and sinful and and to the most degree but what do you think of ruth god loved ruth she was favored by God, and he had his son come from her line. So when you speak of God hating Esau and loving Jacob, talks about the character of the nation, but not the individuals. I don't think God speaks about the individuals here. It makes a big difference. So the way of a, of a nation might be hateful to God, but within this nation might have saints. Um, he, he saved Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. He was a Sodomite. Lot was a Sodomite by by ethnicity and by by not by ethnicity by culture. And if you think about it the same way, also God um, hated and I mean the, the Jerichoites they were condemned to die, but He favored Rahab. So God is not a stereotype person; doesn't like stereotyping, but He sees certain culture uh, go growing evil. And this culture will be an enemy of God, culture who uh, breaks the commandments of God without even, even thinking about it, something normal, becomes normal everyday habit. And that's why we talk about abortion in this culture, how it became something normal. People don't even think about it twice. That becomes an enmity with God. And if we are Christian, we, we say this is wrong. And it should not be normal, like drinking water. We shouldn't say that the things that God said not to be done, to, to be considered legal, okay, everybody should be doing it, it's fine. As if there's no God out there that, that will uh, judge at the end. So this is, I think, and it is important that we understand when God says to him, I will bring you out, he speaks about his generations. I'll bring you out of Egypt. So he's going to do this in the book of Exodus. Uh, the other points that I want to look at too is um, Pharaoh being blessed by Jacob. Here is a transition. Remember how we said at one point Pharaoh represented God the Father and how God the Father gave the dominion to the Son to be the God of Egypt. Egypt at the time was the world. He is, uh, he said that, what well, Jesus said, he said, every power has been given to me on earth and in heaven. And only the Father is above him. Now the change of rules, and I think the signal of the change of the rule of the Father from Pharaoh to Jacob, happens in this statement about Jacob blessing Pharaoh. It's said twice. Jacob blessing Pharaoh, meaning now Jacob is taking his place as the father of, Jacob, of uh, Joseph. While Pharaoh was the father for a little bit, now we have Jacob back into the story. And Jacob is going to do the blessing. And it will be very curious when he comes to bless Joseph before he dies and uh, would be uh, blessing his 12 children now, the, father, the names of the children that we read in 46 were um, the, the second generation, the first generation and second generation, the 12 sons and, and the daughter, Dina, and their kids. That's the second generation, which when they came to Egypt, they were still young. And then this generation will go older and die, and the next generation will take over. So um, these were... Uh, Notice that he gave you 66, 66, the numbers of those who came from Canaan. And then you have four in Egypt, which is Joseph, Asanat, his wife, and Manasseh and Ephraim, four. So the total number of people that belongs to Jacob in Egypt are 70. We're not talking about the slaves and the rest of the tribe. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the, the ones, that's why the Bible keeps repeating, those who came out of his body means the physical descendants of Jacob, not the whole clan. There were much more than that in number. So well, how much will be, how many 
will be uh, the number when they come out of Egypt. That's something to keep in mind as well. Um, notice here um, the names are of, of some people, like for them, uh, my first time to notice that uh, Simeon had married a Canaanite woman. Uh, Judah had his uh, concubine, I'm sorry, his uh, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, bringing uh, two kids, a twin, for him, in addition to Sheila, because the first two had died. Uh, so the, he has two, two children from Tamar. And um, the rest, I think, were... Um, they were not mentioned who were the wives of the rest of the 12 children of Jacob. Okay. The last thing that I spoke about that Joseph had managed to bring Egypt to the slavery of Pharaoh. So they were slowly, slowly, first year they gave up their money, the second year for grain, the second year they had to give up their livestock. The third and the fourth year and so on, they were actually selling themselves as slaves. And they considered it a, 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 like a win-win a situation because they said, we're going to die and all the land is going to go to Pharaoh anyway. So why don't we um, give ourselves to Pharaoh, become slaves of Pharaoh, and he will be we'll be entitled to be fed. And who did this is Joseph. Joseph became the tool by which Pharaoh uh, took possession of the land and of the people. Here is something for you to think about. If we compare Joseph to Christ, then Joseph is supposed to bring the whole world to the Father. And this is what St. Paul is saying. He's saying that, saying that uh, he will have to reign until everybody is uh, subjected. All the enemies are subjected. So they're starting from his brothers all the way to the land of Egypt and then the lands around it, they will be um, in subject to Joseph. But Joseph will take all of them and give them to Pharaoh. If we make that comparison to the typology of Christ, then Christ will, give, will, will bring everybody in the world, not everybody, all the nations, to the subjection of to his sub subjections. And in return, he will give them back to God. So um, that uh, we can we can share the verse actually from uh, Saint Paul, and I said this verse before, and we'll say it again, just for us to be aware of where is this coming from. And I think this is uh, this is one of the places where I answer the question when someone says, "Why do we need to study the Old Testament?" Because this is what explains what a verse like this one. When we uh, look into First um, Corinthians 15, the chapter we talk about for the resurrection, and uh, when he says, in verse First Corinthians 15:24, Saint Paul talks about Christ and the Father. Then comes the end. He says when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Remember, how did Joseph do this? In the famine, Joseph slowly, slowly took all the possessions, everything they owned from the Egyptians and gave it to Pharaoh. So he first took it from them. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And here is a link and hint to what we were talking about, how Jacob bones returning from Egypt is a hint and a, a, a great reminder of the resurrection, conquering of death. So uh, he's, going to, he's going to be uh, in, in rule or ruling until all the enemies have been subjected, including death. For he has put all things, the father has put all things under his feet. That's how Pharaoh did to Joseph, but, and what the father had done to Christ. But when he says all things are put under his feet, we said this, it's evident that he 
the Father, who put all things under him, Christ is accepted. Pharaoh is accepted. So he's, he said, only me will be above you in power. Now, when all things are under sub are subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. We'll see this twice. First, Joseph and Pharaoh. Second, Joseph and Jacob. And we'll see it happening in the in the two scenes. One, two awesome scenes, one after another. One represents the subjection of the whole world and the other subjection, subjection of the church. So um, this is something we will continue in the next time when we read um, the next chapter or the next two or three chapters where we find out how Jesus is going to follow the same, the same pattern that he will, will take us to the Father and give us to the Father so the Father become our Father directly without an intermediate uh, person. And the same thing he's going to do for the world when the world is going to be subjected to God or as well. But they are two different typologies, one with Joseph and Pharaoh and the other between Joseph and Jacob. Uh, here, I, I think um, my final remark on this two chapters or three chapters, con Joseph continue in doing the work. And notice here he does not have to uh, struggle or be proud as if he is a tool in a machine. He's working like it is meant to be, something meant to be. And he knows exactly where he fits in this bigger picture. Something awesome about Joseph. There's no noise about his work or his life. He works very smoothly, very quietly. And as if he has been appointed to do all these things, even when it's not going the way he expected to go. He's quiet. He's not really making big noise or causing big trouble or any of it, or sad or depressed. But as you saw him from, from, one, from one occasion to another, from one encounter to another, he is very peaceful. Um, he's uh, resolute, calm, and just goes about his business that he knows it's going to come to a very good end. Okay. Any questions, additions? I hope this story of Joseph is very exciting and interesting. I have a question, I wanna, but it's kind of going back to like chapter 42 and 43. Sure. But um, when Joseph's brothers come, he says something like, you know, uh, like, don't lie to me because for I fear God. And he says it like twice. Um, what did Joseph mean there? Because, like, did they understand this to mean that this was the God of the Jews? And then if they did, wouldn't they be confused that this Egyptian would be believing in the God of the Jews? And then why would he feel like he would tell them that because was weren't the Egyptians like polytheists? So for him right. to say, I fear God, like what does that mean? What does uh, that mean to him and them? Right. And th that's a very good question. Actually, to put yourself in the shoes of someone of that time, it's very difficult. But I'll tell you what I think. It's almost let me just say this. It's um, a reminiscent, something remind me of the um the image of Saint Mark going through Alexandria and meeting Nianus. And Indianus would scream, oh, the one God, Eotheos. So the same thing uh, is, is not unexpected. Egypt at the time of St. Mark is polytheistic, but there is Jewish communities. Same time in the time of, uh, uh, of Joseph, you might have someone who believes in a God or the one God like Akhenaton. Akhenaton believed in one God, God Atun, son. So there, there are people who believed in, in God. In, in those times, people would not be uh, hung on the specifics. You only think of someone as religious or not. So you might be, you be Greek, you might be Egyptian, but you believe in a God. And, and to them, it might only be a representation of the same God in a different way. 
So in, in a time of in, the, in that time, it's not really very specific. Everybody's confused, and everybody has a manifestation of their god somehow, and they have their own priests and they have their own systems. So it's almost like the relativism of today, if you understand that. Like a, a relativistic person would say, it's all the same God. Allah of Islam is the same as God of the Christians and the Jews. So they're all speaking to the same God. So when Joseph speaks, he speaks as the common person would speak, not to kind of declare himself. So any common person in Egypt or Syria or Mesopotamia would say the same thing. Don't you believe in God? So what, who is that God? Might be Morodok of, of, of uh, God Morodok of, uh, of uh, Babylonians. Um, that might be the God or uh, Atun or Amun of Egypt or Zeus of the Greek. Whatever that God might be, it's the God of the person. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. He was just like using it in a colloquial way, not to like make it exactly. generic, generic God. That yeah. deity, that deity that he believes, the deity that he is uh, kind of keeping fear of, and etc. Okay. I have another question. If nobody else has another one, but um. And also, it's going back a little bit, but like, um, how did Joseph know to, we talked about like last week and the week before, I think it was just last week, that he knew to give his brothers a greater fear than revealing himself to them. How did he, how did he know to do that and not like blurt out and like have a strong desire and I know I mean I know it's because he's he's wise and but like he did it in such a wise strategic way like how did he know how yeah he... that's that's a very good question since you compare that to the beginning of Joseph I don't think Joseph could keep anything in he gets a dream he doesn't think about it he just says it he blurted out like you say and that ends up by being them being very angry. Well, how do you get somebody naive, unexperienced to become wise? What's well, the only way? They go through suffering. Absolutely. He learned. He learned wisdom by what he had suffered. He knew that things doesn't happen overnight. He had this expectation when he was young that things would happen. He'll become a leader of his brothers. They will bow down to him. And he was so excited about it that he said it and didn't really have any kind of uh, a kind of perception of what would happen, the consequences. But as time goes by, he started learning more about people, their manners, how they think, started to know about God's ways, as well as the world around him, how it works. And if he had the wisdom to explain to fear the dream and also plan for it in this way. So he knows the wisdom. And we said this in the pre-serpent class. Wisdom is how to put the knowledge into action. How to put knowledge into action, that's wisdom. And Joseph is a person to learn. He had all the time in the world to learn. Nothing else was going on but to think and reflect and pray and, and wait. Let's say our Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, make us worthy, O Lord, say thank we our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. May the love of God the Father and grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you.